Our Lady of Stars, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Okay, so um, this topic is quite broad and wide, um, but I just wanted to show you some of the, the places that I pulled the information from, so you know when I reference this, what I'm talking about. So the first one, which most of it is based off, is the Apostolic Letter written by St. John Paul II in 1984. Um, it's on the Christian meaning of human suffering, the Latin salvifici dolores. Um, the next one is the Letter to the Friends of the Cross by St. Louis de Montfort. And the last one that I pulled from is called The Pedagogy of Innocent Suffering, written by Father Carlos Gnocchi, who was a Italian priest. Um, yeah, and he encountered a lot of suffering and so wanted to teach those people who he encountered what it meant to suffer well as a Christian. So on that note, um, we see suffering in the world and we wonder where does it come from? What is the meaning of suffering? Did I do something to cause this? Why? I, I don't deserve this suffering. What does it, and then we ask, what does it mean to like, suffer as a Christian? And so St. Paul tells us um, in Corinthians that I, may nothing, that I may know nothing else besides Jesus Christ and him crucified. And it's to know him crucified that um, gives us light on what it means to suffer as a Christian. So um, St. Paul also in his letters to the Colossians says, in my flesh, I complete what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church. And that's this is this verse of scripture is what the apostolic letter hinges on. That's what St. John Paul II talks about, and that's what he references for this whole like little booklet. Um, and so with this lens, we view suffering in a new light. What it means to suffer to um, for the sake of the body, that is the church, like Christ did. So the nature of suffering. So suffering in itself is particular to man and not to animals. And these kind of points are like the little overview, but I'll talk about them as it goes on. Um, that's how St. John Paul II presents these points. So I'm just following literally what he did. Um, so it's particular to man to suffer. Why? It belongs to man's transcendence. Man is destined to go beyond himself in this mysterious way, the path of suffering. It's inseparable from man's earthly existence also because Christ came to earth and became man and he won redemption for us in this particular way through suffering. And the church in her wisdom um, tries to meet us on this path of suffering. And it's the church's way of helping us to encounter Christ too. And suffering in evokes compassion and respect because it's intimidating. We don't like to suffer. And this is part of the mystery because we need, um, we need, it is a need, sorry, of the heart to overcome this fear. And it's an imperative of faith because we dare to touch what seems intangible, untouchable. So then we beg the question, how do we encounter suffering? And a lot of suffering, well, we see primarily through like medicine, right? The body. If I get sick, my health deteriorates, I suffer. And so this is the like one of the first ways that we can encounter suffering. But human suffering is much wider than just the physical because man is complex, right? We're body and soul. So we suffer in multiple ways. So St. John Paul II defines suffering as objective when we refer to the body and soul aspects of suffering. So he states that the physical suffering is like the bodily, the, the pain. And the moral suffering is the pain of the soul. And the psychological suffering is a mix of them both, both the physical and the moral. St. John Paul II, he phrases it quite beautifully um, in his apostolic letter. He says, sacred scripture is a great book of suffering. Um, and this like begged the question when I read this again, like how do I view sacred scripture, like the Bible? Do I view it in light of suffering? I mean, there's lots of examples in, in the Bible of 
people who suffered. One great example is Job. I mean, he was an innocent man, but he suffered a lot of things. Um, like the suffering sermon in Isaiah 53. And there's lots of um, ways that God inflicts suffering on his chosen people, the Israelites. And for example, like the play, the 10 plagues, the death of the firstborn. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, suffering encountered in sacred scripture. So suffering in the Old Testament, um, it meant evil. There's no real word for suffering in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, there's a Greek word. I don't know how to say it. It's in Greek letters. I don't know really. Yeah. But it means, I can tell you what it means. <laughs> it means I am affected by, I experience a feeling, I suffer. And so it's not identified with the evil directly, but it, the person becomes the subject of the suffering in this light of the New Testament. So it's moved from the evil directly to uh, it affects me, the suffering affects me. And suffering in this sense has a subjective and passive character because it happens to us. But um, all of these characters of suffering include like pain, sadness, disappointment, discouragement, despair, but they're all ultimately experiences of evil, which we encounter in different ways. So then, suffering, there's a lot to it, right? The next question that comes up is then, if all of these experiences of suffering pertain to an evil, then what is evil? Good question, you ask. Um, this question is inseparable from suffering. It goes together with suffering. Now, this is pretty cool how St. John Paul II phrases this. So he, he says that society wants a liberation from suffering. They want to feel no pain. They want to feel no, oh, wait, I lost my page. Pain, no, no sadness, no disappointments, no discouragement, no despair. As society, we don't want to feel these experiences of evil. But as a Christian, what does it, what does it mean for us? We have a different response because we see the good of existence created by God, who is goodness himself. We see the goodness of the creator and the creatures and wonder then if everything is so good, why is there suffering? It begs that deeper question. And in this way, suffering calls and challenges us to partake, partake in solidarity and community in a like mysterious way it unites us together in this experience of evil. And man, he suffers. We all know that like we've experienced suffering, right? He suffers due to this evil. So what then is evil in itself? And St. John Paul II says that it's a lack, a limitation, or a distortion of a good. So it's a good, it's related to a good, but it's, it's limited in some way. It's not the fullness of the good. It's because um, of a good that we don't share in, or that we ought to share in this good, and we have not received it. So it's in relation to a good. It's a lack, limitation, or distortion of a good. And so um, Father Carlos Gnocchi, in his letter, Pedagogy of Innocent Suffering, he kind of compares this. It's quite an interesting example. If you imagine the human body, there's a lot of things going on in the body. But we have the heart, right? And it pumps and it's the source of life for the body. I mean, I mean, yeah, you know, oxygen and things. There's lots of things going on. But he compares, like, um, society, we share in the common good of things. Like your, your like passing your exam. That's also my. Re I rejoice in that that you pass your exam. Or if it's someone's birthday, we all rejoice together in someone's <laughs> birthday. And that's like the arteries pumping, like the oxygenated blood around. So if we share in the good, he poses this question: Why not also do we? Does society, does us as a community, not share in the bad, the experiences of bad? And he compares this to the veins, which takes the deoxygenated blood, but pumps it back to the heart and it becomes good again. And in this way, I think it's a very nice example that we can view suffering to. So if we partake in the good together, why not also do we not partake in the bad with each other and unite ourselves in that together? Okay, so we've talked about a little bit about evil 
and we understand a little bit that we suffer due to evil and it's this lack and distortion of the good. And if we share in the good with each other, then we should also share in the bad with each other, the suffering. So why suffer? So we I touched on this a little before, that suffering is essential to man and not to animals. So like when an animal suffers, I mean, we see it suffering. It's like shivering or it's like whimpering if it's a dog, you know. I have a dog at home. That's what my dog does. Mm -hmm. um, or like he like he winces or he like he really wants to like cozy up to you. He doesn't want to let go. I mean, they animals experience this pain, but they can't ask why do I experience this pain? Only man can ask the question why when we suffer. And these are all questions, these questions about evil and suffering, we don't pose to each other. We don't pose to the world, but we pose them, like we ask them to God because he's our creator. And if everything is good, why is there suffering? Why is there evil? And so these frustrations arise with God and can sometimes lead to a denial of God. Also, when we suffer, it obscures the image we have of the world and creation if we don't understand the meaning of suffering. Also obscuring our image of God. And so we arrive at this question, what really, okay, we, we, under, we know that we, there's evil and we know that there's suffering, but what is the meaning? What's the purpose behind it all? Why is there suffering in the world? And why do we experience it? So God inflicts suffering on these chosen people. For example, Job. He was an innocent man, but he endured a lot of suffering. I mean, his whole family wiped out. He experienced sores from head to toe. And the, his friends thought that he suffered because it was a punishment for something that he did, of a sin or something that he did wrong. But not all suffering is associated with a punishment. So how does this like line up? In Job's case, his suffering demonstrated his righteousness, his belonging to God, and it was the nature of a test. And in this, in this way, it like foretells the passion of Christ. And suffering corrects in order to lead to conversion. So there's a beautiful quote from Hebrews. It says, for the joy that lay before him, the joy that lay before Jesus, he enjoyed the cross. And suffering serves, serves for this conversion by rebuilding the goodness in man as we recognize God's mercy and calls us to repentance, calls us to penance also, which overcomes evil in us, which lies dormant in us and strengthens our relationships. So this answer, answer to suffering, like this it, it's the nature of a test, is ultimately found in the cross. The answer to this suffering is divine love. It's the richest and source and meaning of suffering. And by entering into this mystery, we can only grasp it by understanding it through the path of love. It's a way of suffering illuminated by love. Love in its fullest source is the answer to the meaning of suffering through the cross. So in John 3.16, um, you see, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. So part of God's salvific work, this dimension of redemption that man should not perish, but have eternal life. And this redemption strikes at the root of evil, because God loved us so much that he gave his only son, And through this love, um, through the redemption of the cross, evil is struck down. And this evil is from sin and death. So in this sense, perishing is a loss of eternal life, which is the opposite of salvation. And perishing in this sense is not temporal, but it's like beyond the temporal. It's not of this time. So Jesus definitively defeated this through suffering, as we know, through the cross. So... Um, St. John Paul II breaks it down into like the roots of evil, um, which are bound to sin and to death. So how did Jesus break these bonds of evil? So we look at sin, and then we can look at death. So sin, he conquered through obedience. He was obedient even unto death, right? In Philippians. Um, no, 
the cantle of, of humility, that one. So he conquered it through obedience. And in this way, we have an, like a view of um, things to come, an eschatological view of suffering. He conquered it because he conquered it in a time and a place, in a historical dimension. But did he deserve to suffer? No, like God, Jesus was completely innocent. And this goes to show the complex nature of sin, which is involved in suffering. So through conquering sin, Jesus blots out the dominion of sin and original sin and gives us the opportunity of living in sanctifying grace. He calls us to live a life of holiness. And then he conquers death. He did that through his resurrection. So death, in a worldly sense, as we mentioned before, is liberation from suffering. But with man, our body decays, but the soul lasts. It's immortal. Death does not destroy the soul. So through Jesus' victory over sin, he takes away the dominion over death as well and gives us the hope for the future res resurrection of the body. So through this, man has hope of eternal life and holiness, the two things that Jesus cut down, the roots of evil, sin, and death. He gives us a, um, a call to holiness and a call to eternal life. So this victory was won through Jesus' cross and resurrection, the Paschal mystery. Jesus took on all of man's sins. And I mean, if you think about that, all of man's sins, past, present, future, all. You can understand the depth of his passion and his passion is substitutive and redemptive in his nature because he is the lamb of god the innocent one who bore all our sins and saved us gave us the great gift of salvation so it doesn't abolish the cross does not abolish temporary suffering but it sheds new light on suffering ultimately it is the good news right good news is salvation but it's proclaimed through the cross. We always have Jesus on the cross. So Christ suffers, but he does it voluntarily and innocently. He carries the greatest possible answering to suffering, which is the good news of the cross. Um, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's in Corinthians 1.18. And you can see this, his prayer at Gethsemane, Gethsemane. Father, if it is possible, let this pass from me, but not as I will, but as you will. So even he understands that, I mean, he's taking all this on, but he still wills to take it on. He under, like that, that humanity in him is confronted by the cross, but he still accepts it. And it's echoed also in Mary when she says, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. She accepts whatever comes from being the mother of God. And so the prototype of suffering is Christ, the son of God, innocent and most pure, who died for the redemption of man, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's from um, John Milton. Okay. The cross is, the, or, is in the new order linked to love. So the supreme good of redemption drawn from the cross is like reaches its climax in suffering. Christ took on the totality of sin and bought redemption through his blood. Every man has his own share in the redemption. And we are also called to share in that suffering through which redemption was accomplished. Love creates good by drawing it out by means of suffering. This I found really interesting, that suffering is drawn out. I mean, it's very, I mean, St. John Paul II, that's why he's a saint. So this is the answer to the question of suffering. It's love drawn out through suffering. It's a different lens to which we look at suffering. Um, I read this in one of St. Apostles Liguri's books, but I'm not sure where he originally got it from, but it's Asisayama. This, it was, this is what it means to love, like the cross. That's what it means to love. And through this love, drawn out of suffering. Page four. Okay. So in the cross, we see the great love of God. He died for us. He took on all of our sins and won for us redemption. 
So we, and we see this great paradox of suffering and glory and also weakness and strength. So St. John Paul II says, the eloquence of the cross and death is, however, completed by the eloquence of the resurrection. They go hand in hand, the cross and the resurrection, they can never be separated. And um, St. Paul again, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. So Christ opened his sufferings to man and Christ shares in all of our human sufferings in this way. And we, through faith, are enriched through suffering also. I mean, viewing suffering as a gift. In the eyes of man, Christ emptied himself out completely. I mean, humiliated, the foolishness of the cross. But in the eyes of God, he was lifted up. And he demonstrates the power of God. So it's interesting to see these two different viewpoints, the weakness and strength. The cross viewed in, as weakness in the eyes of man, but in the eyes of God, he was lifted up, he was exalted and demonstrates the strength of God. Um, in John chapter nine at the beginning, um, the disciples ask Jesus about the blind man, the, and his parents, who sinned that the man should be blind? Um, they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus replies, neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the work of the works of God might be made visible through him. So we see this, this paradox of the weakness being the means that God can work through us and strengthen us. And suffering is always a trial which humanity is subject to, but it allows for spiritual maturity, so growth, the strength of the interior. And we see this in the examples of many of the saints. I mean, they all suffered in their own regard and in the martyrs as well. And in Philippians, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Really, as Christ, it's God who works in us to strengthen us through whatever trials we go through. Um, again, in, two, in the second Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I will rather boast most gladly of my weakness in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. So through weakness, through the self-emptying, through suffering, God makes his power known. This paradox of the weakness and the strength the suffering which leads to glory. The eloquence of the cross and death is, however, completed by the eloquence of the resurrection. The Paschal mystery goes together. Can't separate the cross from the resurrection. I think it's Fulton Sheen says, you can't have the resurrection without Good Friday. I mean, they go together. Okay, suffering helps us in different ways. How, you might ask. Okay, so suffering helps us to Firstly, persevere, which unleashes hope and confirms our dignity and the meaning of life. We realize ultimately that we're made for God. If we persevere through the suffering with great patience, we have hope for eternal life because that's how Christ won um, salvation for us. And it confirms that we are a child of God and that we are meant for God alone. By sharing in God's love, man rediscovers himself, his soul, his dignity, which he had thought, which, sorry, which he thought he lost because of suffering. How many times do we see our loved ones or anyone really who suffers and they don't know their worth or their dignity? They don't know who they are anymore. They're defined completely by their pain. But really, they should be hope, like hopeful that for eternal life, that through their suffering, they can discover what really they were made for and whose they are, because they're gods, we're all his children. So this is actually, St. John Paul II says, the creative character of suffering, because we complete what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. The redemption of Christ is absolute and complete. It's com accomplished by love. How can we add anything to it, right? It is complete in itself. The cross is the inexhaustible and infinite sacrifice. It's true, we cannot add anything to it, but we can share in it 
through the body of Christ, the church. This is really cool. Christ did not bring this redemption to a close. This is how we share in it, because it remains open in the sacrifice of the mass. And through the mass, we participate in Christ's suffering, and he, in a special way, is with us when we suffer too. Christ desires that his redemptive suffering be unceasingly completed, and it's found in the mystery of the church, which, like Christ, is human and divine. The church is both human and divine. Um, Don Gnocchi compares the mass to a river of divine blood. I mean, it's a little gory, but beautiful at the same time, which is enriched when it converge converges with human pain. In this divine river, that hum human suffering acquires a supernatural value of redemption. And this is like through the mass where we offer our sufferings with Christ on the cross, which is made present to us at the mass. So representation, but an unbloody representation of Calvin. Um, Don Nocchi says, if there is a noble interest behind every pain of life, living will become both sacrificial and poetic. I mean, everything we can offer um, for our, like to be united with Christ on the cross, to understand this view of redemption through love. Um, and I find this, this is a quote that I find interesting, but Christ chooses to keep his wounds of suffering in his glorified body. So when he, re he appears to the disciples in the upper room, he shows them the, the places where the nails were in his hands and his feet and the, the lance that pierced his side, the opening where the lance pierced his side. And Fortune Sheen says, the scars not only rem are reminders that life is warfare, but they are also pledges of victory in that war. Our blessed Lord said, I have overcome the world. By this, he means that he has overcome evil in principle. The victory is assured, only the good news has not leaked out. The worst thing that evil can do is kill God. Having been defeated in that, in evil's strongest moment, when evil wore its greatest armor, it can never be victorious again. So even though Christ suffered all of that, he keeps, still keeps those wounds to show his great love. Okay, I'm almost there. I hope you're with me. <laughs> okay, the last part. So um, in the apostolic letter, St. John Paul II calls this section the gospel of suffering. Um, and he kind of has this theme of suffering through the Bible, like viewing through the lens of one who suffers. And he says the gospel really is a book of suffering because Christ came into the world to save us and that was accomplished through the cross. He says, St. John Paul II says, this suffering leads to conversion. It's a new dimension of life and vocation. With this conversion, we co cooperate with grace. And he, this is this part I really like. Sorry, I get really excited sometimes. Um, he says, it's a wonderful exchange with Christ evil for the good so christ exchanges us he takes our evil but he gives us the good of eternal salvation i mean like every time i read that i'm like wow that's very very beautiful i mean and we can see that this exchange he comes down to us as um, during christmas he comes to us a baby he exchanges like the glory of being united like with god the father and the holy spirit he comes down to us as a baby and he exchanges all of our sufferings for the good of eternal salvation. So every form of suffering has new life in the cross. Um, and from the cross comes the love of um, Jesus's sufferings. So spiritual union with Christ, it gives us the salvific meaning of suffering. And this meaning of suffering, Christ's salvific meaning of suffering, descends to us as man. Because we can't discover like the meaning of suffering by ourselves. It, it comes to us. Um, and from suffering well, we find joy. And this joy is found when we overcome the sense of the uselessness of suffering. How many people think that suffering is useless? It's a waste of time. But really, when we discover what suffering is, it clears the way for grace in our souls. And this value of suffering is still written by us today. It's part of our own stories when we suffer in union with Christ. 
and it's part of the infinite treasure of the world's redemption, which we can also share with others. Um, Don Yonke has a beautiful example. There was a child who uh, was playing on, I think it was a, mine, a minefield and a grenade blew off. And he lost both his legs and one of his eyes. And so they had to amputate his legs and extract his eye. And he goes into this little boy's room. Actually, I should read it, it's quite nice. Um, his, this little boy's room, and he asks him some questions. Page seven. Um, oh yes, he says, but don't you believe that there might be someone whom you could offer your pain for? Couldn't the love of someone give value to your pain and attempt to suppress your sufferings and tears? helping you to bear better your sufferings. This, the boy's name's Marcos. Marcos had a fixed and empty and desolate stare with his only eye, because he had only one eye, enlarged by surprise. He moved his head as he replied, I don't understand. With that, he returned to play absentmindedly with the hem of his bed sheet. At that moment, um, Don Yaki realized what had occurred. It was the loss of a treasure, like a diamond of inestimable value, more precious than a notebook to, to a famous author. It was the great and innocent suffering of a child which fell to emptiness, uselessly and insignificance. It was the supernatural loss for him and for all humanity because it, he was not directed in the only way in which suffering is able to find value and justification through Christ crucified. So like even the little boy, when asked about suffering, realized that he had lost a great treasure that he could offer for someone else. I mean, and that's a, a nice way for us to view our suffering as a little treasure that we can offer to Jesus for others as well. Okay. okay. Suffering in this regard, even though it happens to us and we receive it, is not passive in ourselves. Christ is active in his suffering. He, he endured the cross, he carried the cross, and he calls us to minister to those around us also. When he separates the sheep from the goats, he said, you did it to me. And um, St. John Paul II has a, a little chapter about the Good Samaritan and how we encounter suffering. But I mean, I don't have so much time. So the, the three points that he raises is to stop, to recognize suffering, to have compassion, and then to actually go out and help like the Good Samaritan did. In this book, The Friends of the Cross, St. Louis of de Montfort describes like how this carrying our cross can be practical for us. So, I mean, we talked a lot about suffering, about evil, etc. but how does it apply to us? How do we take up our cross? So in Matthew 16, 24, it says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so St. Louis de Montfort breaks this phrase down into four points. He says, firstly, you have to desire to become a saint. I mean, these are strong words. Desire to become a saint. Um, and it comes straight from this, this uh, scripture verse. If anyone wills, come after me. We have to will to come after Jesus. We need a firm resolve to relinquish all things and undertake anything to suffer for Jesus. The second is self-denial. Let him deny himself. So if anyone wills, come after me and let him deny himself. So we need to like change our viewpoint to glory in poverty and humiliations and suffering, which is what Christ gloried in. And that's this mortification, death to self. The third part of the phrase is let him take up his cross. So he describes it quite beautifully, but he says our crosses come from the cross of Christ. He gives us a section, carves it out, makes it our special cross. And that is the cross that sanctifies us, that makes us holy. And he says we must carry it and not drag it. How many times are we resistant to the cross, myself included? Be like, I don't want that one. I don't want that cross, but it's to accept it and carry it. And it is the cross we must carry and not anything else. So if our, our hands are full with carrying the cross, there's no room for anything else. And a great example of this is Mary at the foot of the cross. She didn't worry what people thought of her or anything to that nature. She stood faithfully at the foot of the cross. 
And the last part of the phrase is, and follow me. So if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and the fourth part, and follow me. And St. Louis de Montfort, he lists 14 ways to follow Jesus carrying the cross, but I mean, I, I picked four that were really good. I mean, they're all really good, but <laughs> just four. So he says to ask for the wisdom of the cross, to show us the mystery of faith, what it means, what the cross means in itself. The second was to take advantage of your sufferings, especially the small ones. He says, St. Louis de Montfort says, to suffer much or little for the sake of God is to suffer like a saint. It doesn't have to be the big things that we suffer in, but the, even the little things, when we suffer them well for God, they become saints. And he says also to embrace crosses with humility and gratitude, with the cross being a, a, a gift that we have received, and to conquer ourselves, to choose what is least preferable, like to choose the hard sometimes, the hardest one. Um, okay. Just to wrap up, there's a beautiful quote from Gaudium et Spes. says, only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light. Christ, the final Adam, by the revelation um, of, man, I'm hyper, of the master of the father. I mean, I don't know what that, that says. Anyway, I'm going to keep going. I'll find you the proper quote later. I mean, significant typo. Very bad. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, and his love fully reveals man to himself and makes his supreme calling clear. So only in, in the light of, of the incarnate word do we really understand what man is. And where do we see him? We see him in the crib, throughout his life, and on the cross. So in the light of the cross, we find what man truly is, and we find his supreme calling to love. So we understand a little more about redemption, how it's rooted in suffering, and in love, we really find the meaning of suffering because it's salvific, it saves us, it redeems us, and the meaning of this sorrow. We look to Mary who stood at the foot of the cross and who also accompanies us and stands at the, all of our crosses of mankind. So if you imagine it, Mary stood at the foot of the cross when Jesus was on the cross, but she also stands with us in a particular way when we carry our own cross. She's always there as our mother. And um, she, the cross is a source of strength for not only us, but for the church and for humanity. And St. John Paul II finishes by saying, may our suffering in union with the cross and with Christ be victorious. And so how often time, like how, how often do we think that if we only, if we do things, that's how we become a saint. Or if I pray, that's how I become a saint. But this is like the last thing when we can ask questions. But St. Anthony Mary Claret, he has this beautiful quote. He says, Christian perfection consists in three things, praying heroically, working heroically, and suffering heroically. So in this light, we, um, yeah, that's redemptive suffering. <laughs>